yet seen across the world bringing you hope, expectation and possibility. From this conference, let us send our congratulations, good wishes and friendship to the new President of America. President Obama, we salute you and we wish you well. But he is in need of more than our good wishes. On his shoulders rests a heavy burden of responsibility. The economic crisis is still with us, evolving and deepening. The events of the past weeks in Gaza illustrate the urgent necessity of finding and pursuing the path to peace in the Middle East. And 2009 should be the year we summon the will and wit to conclude a new treaty on climate change, one which will have America as a signatory. The challenges are immense, and the new president will have need not just of cheerleaders, but of partners, not just of spectators wishing him to do good, but of supporters helping him to do it. Our news, when not dominated by the terrible events of Palestine, has been submerged, as you know, in the economic catastrophe that has hit the financial sector of the world's economy and now is spread across the real economy. We face recession, or worse. It is hard at this moment of immediate crisis to focus on the longer-term challenge our environment faces. But it's necessary. For presidents and prime ministers, the problems do not come sequentially or in disciplined order of priority. The agenda sets itself. My point to you today is very simple. It is now, right now, at the instant when our thoughts are centered on the economic challenge, that we must not set to one side the challenge of global warming, but instead resolve to meet it and put the world on a path to sustainable growth for the future. Now is the moment when our responsibility to future generations must be answered. For the decisions of 2009 will determine the world of 2029 or 2049. The way to the future must therefore be opened in the present time. What is more, I would argue that the current economic woes provide us not with an excuse for inaction, but a reason for acting. Let us stimulate economic growth by investing in alternative energy and energy efficiency. And let us invest now in these times of lower carbon price to prepare for the times when that price rises again. Let us put economic growth and combating climate change in alliance, not in opposition. For who now seriously doubts the scale of the challenge to our environment? The scientific consensus is reasonably clear, except to the willfully blind. The climate is changing. It is changing through the actions of humanity, not nature. Without changing our behavior, and cutting dramatically CO2 emissions. The planet will suffer profound and irreversible damage. In turn, this requires, and within the coming decades, transformative change in the manner of our economic growth. We have to eliminate our dependence on carbon. And yet, as we speak, emissions are rising. What is more, even if such dramatic action is taken in the developed world that has created the problem, over time, the same reduction in emissions will have to happen in the developing world too, notably China and India. Otherwise, the gains in one part will be annulled by the losses in the other. 
The climate does not distinguish between the different places of origin of the emissions. And that is why action, even according to differentiated obligations, has to be action done in common on a global basis if it is to be effective. And it must involve those who produce the oil and the coal, as well as those who consume them. That's why it is so extraordinary and inspiring that this conference takes place here in Abu Dhabi. Those who know the history of this nation know that Sheikh Zayed was a conservationist and environmentalist long before it was fashionable. And today, Mazda continues his legacy and in the pioneering new city now taking shape, is sending out a clarion call of progress. Well done, Mazda, on what you have done and what you now will do. You are an example to the world. Thank you.